And we're going to do Q&A and a panel right now. So I'm going to let Christian do all this and track down um, the other remaining speakers. But um, Christian, take it away. And CMAC, um, thanks for, for joining us today. Uh, are you still in Sweden, CMAC, or are you back in Canada? I, I am still in Sweden. Yeah, ah. Canada was too cold for me, so I came to the <laughs> Also, see him to somewhere else. Sweden. <laughs> Sweden is nice, okay? Canada's pretty nice too, but um, yeah, and Pinky has joined us, so wonderful. And Pinky, where are you hiding out these days? I'm in Arizona, so yeah, it's pretty pleasant here. <laughs> awesome, guys. Well, well done, um, CMAC, and I will see if I can trace down um, Jamie for us in the backstage. I'm going to leave you all in the capable hands of Christian, so um, take it away. Yeah, yeah, so... Um... Actually, you know, uh, Pinky kind of kind of joined us. Uh, we kind of added her last minute, so you know, we we, we kind of were like, okay, well, she can do the panel. Uh, we had we had room on the panel, so real quick, Pinky, if you can introduce yourself. I know uh, we heard CMAC and Cornelia earlier, but if you just quickly introduce yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my name is Priyanka Ravi. I also go by Pinky, um, and I have been a user of Flux and GitOps for I think two and a half years now. Um, I actually started. Uh, I started with GitOps at State Farm, where I was a um, on the platform, the GitOps platform team, and I recently just uh, moved to WeWorks, where I'm a DX engineer now. So. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was awesome for those. Uh, for those of you who weren't at uh, GitOps Con in, in North America, she great. She made uh, an amazing presentation. One of my favorite presentations there. So if you catch the the playlist there, um, it, it's really. I always love hearing end, end user stories. So um, you know, here here at the end, we we kind of try to get everyone together. Um, I think um, um, I think we, we couldn't get Dan because of his schedule. I'm not sure. I'm still trying to track him down. See, hopefully he can make it, but we won't. But we'll see here. Um, to have kind of like a Q and A session. I'll, I'll um, you know, kind of, uh, for, for those of you who are here, feel free to drop a question either in the chat uh, on the event tab or the stage tab. I keep switching back and forth. I'm not 100% sure where I should be, but uh, I'm switching back and forth. So don't worry about that. I'll, I'll, I'll seed you guys the questions. Um, so I, I think I'd like to start uh, since um, we gave all the other presenters time uh, to speak. I think I'll, I'll start with, with Pinky. With, with with my first question here, because you know what, let's just let's just start with Pinky because she, she wasn't able to to present. No, so. I'm your favorite. It, 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 don't, yes, don't, exactly. Don't, I'm not just I'm just exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's well. I mean, if we're gonna be honest now, um, <laughs> so um, you know, I actually actually this this question came came to mind because I actually attended one of your talks. You you you, you did a did a WeaveWorks um, presentation and and um, you know you, you did a a meetup right a, a GitOps meetup with, with WeaveWorks. And this question pops to mind, and it, it has it relates to um, the kind of the presentation I did. So GitOps seems really like a like a fully automated operation model for your your entire platform, right? So, um, do you think we can start getting the benefits of GitOps, even if like someone isn't a hundred percent ready to implement all the principles or, or, or all the components? Um, you know, if you're not really ready to implement maybe all of it, can you still kind of get the benefits? From, from GitOps? Yeah, I actually got this question a lot during my time at State Farm. Um, and so like some teams are just not ready. Um, they're still using certain pipelines. There's, you know, Jenkins, if, because in, at that time we were using GitLab CI in our process. Um, so yes, the, yes. Um, basically the first step is to obviously define all your deployments or your infrastructure, whatever you're doing um, declaratively as code. Um, so that, it, and th that in of itself comes with so many benefits, right? Because one, you know what your desired state is by just going and looking at it instead of all these manual like processes. And then also um, it's something that's repeatable and reusable as well, right? So there's a lot of benefits to just doing that one step. Um, and then the like e the next step is just going and creating something like a config repo where you can actually store code there. And even if you're just doing manual deployments from there, like for the time being, that's still valuable. And then you can kind of get a pattern of which ones you're more doing like deployments for manually. And from there, you can actually take those projects first and then start uh, like applying an operator such as uh, my experiences with Flux, right? Um, and so you can easily set an operator like that up and then just have it listening to your repo. And then, you know, from there, it's kind of like magic. Yeah, from, from there, it rolls downhill, right? Like, it's yeah. like oh, okay. Yeah, and then you kind of just start what? hitting all of the principles. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Just, it, it's natural after that, yeah. 
yeah, it's almost like a natural progression. It's like, oh, yes. once I start doing this, and then the next thing becomes easier and easier and easier, right? right. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of curious, uh, um, Jamie, if, if you kind of had the similar, you know, she, she was at State Farm, right? Like you're at U University of Michigan. Did, were you, did you do that same thing, right? Did you have that, that, that same kind of like, we're going to do this one small thing first, and then, you know, it kind of just rolled after that? Yeah, exactly. I think that um, it's it's helpful to start out with those small pieces. Look for things that you um, that the DevOps or devs are repeating. Look for things that they do over and over. Look for things that just require a small change, like per environment, right? Like uh, you just need this variable change, or you just need um, whatever, you know. Um, and build it out bit by bit, and that's the technical aspect. The other thing is the cultural stuff, and we've touched on that a little bit here today, but you have to work with developers. Um, if you're the one just doing the DevOps stuff, work with developers, find out what their workflow is, find out how you can nurture this transition um, by automating things that will make it easier for them. Make it, try to find ways in which you can show them benefit if you're doing a, a big culture change, basically. Um, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think doing that and then the things that I touched on uh, at the end of my presentation, you know, folks can check back on, on that as well. Is have, There's some great tips in there in terms of some of the technical things that you can do. Cool, cool. There's, there's actually a, a question coming in. I'm actually going to pause that question because I think um, I, I want to, I originally had this question for Dan, but I, but I think, but I think I'm going to ask it uh, to Cornelia because, um, so sorry to put you on the, on the spot here for, for a question that was meant, meant for Dan. That's, that's what the <laughs> panel is. <laughs> that's what a panel is. But, but I, but since, you know, you were involved in the process of the GitOps principles, you know, you and I were in that meeting, a ton of those meetings together. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, you know, I'm kind of curious. So like what, what? considerations were taken into account when the GitOps principles were being drafted, right? I, I, I kind of know these que the answer to this question, but I, I kind of want to get your input, right? Like what kind of, I, I'm, I'm kind of think, so there were a lot of opinions, which means a lot of obstacles. You know, what, what were some of those obstacles that, that you saw that, you know, um, we, that we were trying to overcome when, when developing those principles? Yeah, I, and that's a really great question to dovetail from the one that you were just talking about, which is, mm -hmm. What consistently comes up is, hey, do I have to get all the way to the Holy Grail? And um, and so I, I just want to add on to what the what the other two participants already said. And, and that is, even if you're not doing GitOps, adding automation, hugely valuable. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't um, mean don't automate it, right? <laughs> and, and so I think the most contentious thing when we started building the principles was, do we really need to specify, for example, that it has to be convergent? Um, or do we really need to specify the principle that, you know, Git is the only way for you to affect things? And the tension that we fell into is that it's easy to, to in the beginning, say, okay, well, okay, we'll, we'll dilute the definition of GitOps so that people don't feel, so people feel like they have a way of getting started. And in the end, we decided that there were a certain set of principles that were so essential that we wanted to be that prescriptive. Now, again, that doesn't mean you can't get on a path to getting to full GitOps and still realize value. So I think that was the, the, the biggest fundamental tension was, do I really need a convergent system? Can't I just check things into Git and have a script run and call that GitOps? And the answer is, no, let's not call it GitOps. But yes, please do it. If what you're doing today is clicky, clicky interfaces, by all means, create a, a script that triggers off of a Git check-in. Um, but we really want you to get the, the, the ultimate values which is which comes only when you when you embrace those four principles, or maybe it's five by now. But we really tried to stay very kind of axiomatic, so that we weren't adding things that didn't provide additional value. We tied those things to value. Yeah, no, that that's um, the. I think you touched on a very interesting point. This is like the value, right? The value you get from a lot of this automation 
um, I think very, very early on in the GitOps working group is like, well, we don't want to like exclude people from the club, right? But also we do want to define what GitOps is. So, you know, I, I think distilling that into like principles of like, um, you know, uh, version controlled and immutability doesn't necessarily mean Git, even though it's GitOps, right? Like we talk about GitOps, doesn't necessarily yep. because we didn't want to exclude other other methods, right, of, of doing, like, for example, like object storage, right, that is immutable, and that is version, you can version those, so, um, so I, I think that's very, very great. Um, CMAC, I know it's late for you, and I don't want to, I don't want to ignore you, um, I, but so I, so there's quite, there is questions coming up, so I think maybe I'll, I'll start this question with you, um, so these, these are, you know, I'm, I'm not, um, um, you know, I'm not putting you in a weird position, this is just, the way no the dice rolled, right? The way the dice rolled in the questions, right? So maybe you don't know. So um, the question comes from Jeffrey too about um, using GitOps at the edge, right? And so um, what would, you know, first of all, like how does that fit very well in terms of using GitOps at the edge? And, and second, um, are, are there concerns about using GitOps at, at the edge? Um, yes, yeah. So there are like, a couple of aspects when it comes to edge which uh, affects pretty much any any application that is running there any service that is that is running there including how you approach the get out workflow the first piece of that is is a matter of scale right so like i i spoke about GitOps picking up because of the number of clusters are growing and this is in the numbers of 10 50 100 when we're talking about edge then we are we are speaking about thousands multiple um uh, 10,000, 100,000 uh, endpoints and, and devices we talk about in vehicle um, uh, services. And that changes the perspective of uh, when we talk about GitOps, there is with GitOps and Kubernetes clusters, there is always the pull and push model conversation. There's a choice that customers have depending on their security and compliance or some of the other aspect they choose one or other when it comes to edge. That, that choice really disappears. There's only one way to think about this. The connectivity is not always there. So the, the solution needs to become more resilient of um, uh, uh, when, when there is, when that device cannot reach back home or the near edge uh, centers of service that doesn't disrupt the service that is running on, um, on it. And it doesn't prevent whatever engine or software or Argo CD or Flux or anything else that is running there, a small version of it and enabling the GitOps workflow for that device to pull the configuration, that doesn't get disrupted. We, we have seen similar cases with not age, but in, in the connect from the connectivity perspective has been similar with Argo CD being on cruise ships around the world. So they come in and out of network and that, that, that that we have seen some of the issues that it can create and, and address in, in Argo City. Um, the, the mere fact of being so many reaching about back to a Git repo, that can create other problems for the Git provider that is not easily surfaced in regular applications that are being deployed, right? If you have 10,000 uh, instances of a device coming to a particular Git repo to pull their configuration, that's not something that necessarily um, the Git providers are, are ready for or would be ready for. So the way that this works also might need to change on the on the GitOps part, on the engine that is doing this. So there are multiple aspects of like that that flaky infrastructure that it, an edge device is, and then the nature of the limited compute and and spotty network that exists on these devices that changes some of the assumptions that the uh, we have within the existing GitOps tooling, and and those those needs to change a little bit. Yeah, I, I, would, I oh go ahead, go ahead, Cornelius. I, I would love to pile on a little bit on this. Um, just a moment ago, we were talking about are all the principles essential, and and we said no, yes, that we we had a minimal set and we tied it to value. So, what is one of the values that we were tying these principles to? Well, it's autonomy, it's independent system autonomy, which is in absolutely critical on the edge. We can't have an edge network where there's all sorts of dependencies between nodes and the edges, between this, the central hub and the edges. So GitOps is absolutely essential when, when it comes to doing things at scale. And 
CMAC, you, you talked about scale and size, but it's also obviously that distributed nature. And that's my last point to add on to this. We keep mm -hmm. talking about Git being um, versioned immutable. There's another attribute of Git that is also very interesting, which is it's a versioned immutable distributed system. And so CMAC, you're absolutely right. We have to solve problems of how often are we cloning down to the edges and, and there needs to be throttling and things like that. But Git on by its very nature already has a whole bunch of capabilities in it around disconnected, distributed, all of that stuff. And so Git being versioned, mutable, and distributed is a way that it serves these edge use cases. Yeah, and I, I was actually going to... Um... By the way, it, it relates to what I was going to say, so perfect. Because I, I remember um, we, we did a panel at KubeCon, and we, we kind of touched on a little bit of, of, about this, about about Git. But I, first of all, I, I just like to like to say having Argo being deployed on a ship is just like perfect, right? Because it's like <laughs> it's like that's what he's named after a ship. Um, so, <laughs> but so some some of the things that we've been, you know, in, in Jamie, you've been. Um, part of some of these conversations in, in the GitOps working group talking about the idea of Git mirrors and using payloads, um, you know, with, with respect to the source of truth, right? Because you can always just tar up your, um, you know, your, your Git repo and it'd be cool to have that as your payload, right? You know, to have for edge use cases, for disconnected use cases. So that's, um, you know, again, if, if you want to be involved, uh, um, um, the, the Open GitOps group, we, we meet every other Wednesday, uh, opengitops.dev, if you want to learn more about that. So this next question, I love this, this next question because um, it's, it's going to go uh, to both Jamie and, and Pinky because you guys are end users. Um, so I'll pick on you. Whoever wants to chime in first, go ahead, feel free. Um, so there are, so I, I think maybe I should, this is by Anonymous, which is, uh, makes it a little eerie. Um, <laughs> someone anonymously asked this. Um, so there are certain instances where configuring the cluster are not possible to do declaratively or in, in this person's opinion, declaratively, right? So things like host subnets, uh, ciders, uh, machine and node get deleted, right? So some tasks are, are, are almost like you, you can't do them with declaratively, right? Like, you know, like VMs, right? Like nodes like networks. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious about, you know, both of you, Pinky, your time at, at Safe Arm and, and Jamie, how, how do you guys, how did you guys manage those, um, the things that weren't get opsable, let's just say. So I, whoever wants to go first, go ahead. I'll let you guys step on each other. Who wants to go first? Do you want to go ahead? Go. <laughs> I, I actually cheated a little bit and I had to ask Kingdon uh, about this one. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I was checking if Flux can do this and it actually, I'm pretty sure it can um do exactly what they're saying so you can you can patch resources and stuff like that i don't know argo obviously I'm, I'm limited to my experience with flux but um yeah i think this actually can be done um and there are maybe some like things you'd have to kind of finagle to do it but um yeah so that that was an interesting question because i had to get <laughs> <laughs> so from our perspective um anything that can be pulled down in a manifest can be modified and right, applied yeah. back up, right? Customize right. is great for doing stuff like that. Um, so check out the customize tool. The other thing is there are um, some tasks that we've found where maybe it isn't all declarative. Maybe there needs to be a tool that takes the declarative and apply, uh, applies it imperatively um, and there's just some instances like that where you're not going to be reading directly from Git to, and applying the manifest directly to the cluster, and there will be something going in between. You just work with those scenarios, right? And you, you put in as much as you can and then have a pipeline that will run that tool uh, uh, to, to take the declarative resource and apply it in an imperative way if it needs to be done so. Basically, as much as that can be done declaratively, it should be done declaratively for sure. But yeah, there, there definitely are some situations. I agree. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And there's also like other tools, right? Like we, we talk a lot about Argo, we talk about Flux, but there's things like um, yeah. like, like Terraform, there's things like Ansible right. that, that are like really good for that, that sort of thing, right? 
And so, right. um, you know, part, part of the you know, part of the question, they talk about like networking, like, well, you can technically manage your network configuration. So like I'm an old Cisco guy, right? Like you can have like your, your, your configuration of your Cisco switches. You could technically have that and get and have Ansible apply those like it's not, you know, well, that's you mentioned Terraform. And that's actually what mm -hmm. we're doing right now is we have snippets of Terraform saved in the repositories with the respective apps that we're rolling out or or for our cluster configuration repositories and then using the terraform um container uh to actually apply those in so there's there's ways of doing a lot of that stuff mm -hmm. yeah there's a tool for pretty much everything there's a tool for pretty much everything that's that's very we true. actually <laughs> have a terraform controller coming soon too i know a lot of users i heard about that, that. So yeah did you yeah. <laughs> so that'll be really cool of course it'll it's right amazing. after we got done with all of the work we've been doing <laughs> yeah. I, I like That's how it always works, right? <laughs> I like this conversation about imperative versus, you know, eventually consistent. Um, realize that the the work that say Kubernetes does to actually recover the state from, you know, some divergence from actual and desired state, the code that's on the inside of that is imperative. For the most part, that code is Golang or it's Java or something like that. What we're trying to do with GitOps is we're trying to um, elevate the, the interface to the developer, the DevOps per persona, so that they don't have to deal with that imperative, the hard imperative stuff. And so the, there is no rule that says you can't do some imperative as a part of your automation of the system. It's just that you're taking on that burden. And I know to some people who are used to imperative, going declarative feels like a burden, but in the end, it ends up being so much easier because you're deferring that responsibility for the hairy, hard imperative mm -hmm. stuff. And imperative stuff is the hairy, hard stuff relative to declarative. You're deferring that to a system that's good at that, that will do it consistently, that won't make mistakes and all of that stuff. And that that's a system like Kubernetes or GitOps or something like that. So this next question is um, again also another um, another great question because I honestly don't have an opinion on it. So let's let's just see what you guys what you guys think about it. Um, so there's there's talk about um, pull versus push, right? So well, pulling a configuration versus um, pushing a configuration out, right? I know that Flux. Can do both. I know Argo City can do both, the push and pull. But um, with with respect to GitOps and with like with respect to this is general to everyone, right? So whoever wants to chime in, go ahead. Um, is what's your opinion between on push versus pull? It does it have to be either or? Is this just something that is like whatever works for you? What what's what's the you know what's the consensus on that? Who wants to go first here? Who should I pick on? Siamak, do you have an opinion? I can, I can pick on Siamak. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I can start, uh, definitely. So uh, what what we're seeing, like to, to put it like clear, like very explicitly, we, we don't have an opinion on it. Like what we're seeing that they're both models get practiced a lot because each of them come with some advantages and some disadvantages. And there are some customers can that can live with the disadvantage of either and, and go that way, right? So with the push model, what we hear from customers that they do like that central model of the single pane of glass that is from central place, they can see all the status of everything that is happening across their, their fleet, what status they have. It's one place that gives them like very simple visibility uh, and they can live with uh, having access from outside to all those clusters, right? And we have customers that this is an absolute no-no. It's there's no way that they can have define a, a single piece of network somewhere in the infrastructure that can reach everything. Um, so they, they cannot live with that. And, and the pool model is the only way that they would uh, work with. And we talked about edge where some use cases, it's just impossible to go the other way around. So um, from I personally, I have uh, no opinions that I just see, I see advantages and advantages for each of them and uh, each of them fits certain use cases, I would say. Yeah, I would just add to that that, that so in, in a very specific sense, there are limitations, physical network 
uh, and also compliance. So if you're an organization that deals with compliance, there are some barriers that will define for you whether you're going to do push or pull based on access and whatnot. So that's that's another thing to consider. So I'm I'm in the camp of right tool for for the situation, or right way for the situation. Yeah, Cornelia, Pinky, I don't know if you guys have any additional thoughts on that. I was gonna say patience too. I guess like, are you mm -hmm. are you gonna be patient enough to wait for like in in terms of flux, like the sink interval to hit, right? Or are you do you need it like out there like that? So that's another thing. Depends. Yeah. I think it. It, yeah, I think either one. Right. My my fellow panelists expressed everything that was in my head. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. So I, I think that is a consensus. I don't think I've ever seen strong opinions one way or another. I think since most tools can do both, it, it's one of those things where it's like, well, you know, whatever works for you. Um, it's one oh, of the, the yeah. one thing that I will add is remember, we talked about patterns earlier. It's a pattern that you need to decide on deliberately. Mm -hmm. And yes. different patterns are going to give you different different characteristics. So just understand the pattern and then decide which way you want to apply it. Yeah, for the, for those that um, uh, that know me, I, I can I, I hold very strong opinions. But sometimes my opinions will ch those strong opinions will change depending on what you're doing, right? Sometimes I get asked a question, I go, "Well, tell me what you're doing." My opinion might change depending on 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 what you're doing and how you're delivering it, because I you know uh, it'll be a strong opinion, but it might change. Um, so to, uh, um, uh, you know, to be cognizant of time, right. So, um, you know, to respect everyone's time, I know we, you know, we, we don't want everyone sitting in front of camera all day. I'll ask this last question. And I, I like to get a thought for each one of you. I don't know where you guys are with respect to <laughs> <laughs> in the screen. I may be pointing at myself, but, um, uh, I'd like to ask the question. Actually, this question was originally meant for CMOC, but I'm going to ask it to all of you. So you guys take you know a minute or two to answer. I will start with CMOC and we'll, we'll go. Um, so what, what's, you know, GitOps is so new, but I can't help to think about what's the future, right? So like, what, what, what's next? Where does GitOps go? Where does, where does, where does it take us? What's the next? Um, you know, splat ops, um, <laughs> uh, you know, for marketing phrase that's going to come up. So where do you see, you know, we, we see the benefits of GitOps. Where, where do you, you know, what, what's the future? What's that? If you can, you know, look in your crystal ball, what do you, where do you think it's, it's, it's going? I, I wish I had that with me. I think that's <laughs> awesome, but uh, <laughs> what I, what I think would happen uh, to be frank is that on, on one side, I think uh, the, this, this adoption and movement around GitOps is like related a little bit to the question you ask of what happens when things are not declarative. I think that would that is causing a little bit of change and pushing projects and products toward becoming more declarative. So that that's one aspect of how I see the the coming year um, uh, would play out. That because of the interest in this model of working, the products have to morph themselves. Projects have to morph themselves into something that plays a lot better with the with the GitOps workflow. And the, this is something that we at Red Hat have gone through, WeWork has gone through, and I, I expect a lot of other products that do the same. There's a lot of talks about security as code and, and compliance. And these technologies quite often are, are not really compatible with the GitOps model. So that, that's one aspect that I see that things would change with, with projects adapting themselves to, to GitOps, which is an interesting uh, thing. Um, and, and the other thing is that uh, GitOps is really, despite being around for a, a couple of years, it is at in the very beginning of its adoption cycle or the hype cycle, uh, whatever <laughs> we call it, right? So it, it's still at the very beginning of that steep, uh, like uphill. And, and I think like throughout this, this coming year, we will start like seeing uh, use cases that we have not thought of it as adoption is picking up within the type of customers that um, in, that are like extremely enterprise ready, enterprise like their environments are completely air gap disconnected, like really the type of application that you generally don't see on the SaaS services, right? And and those those use cases I don't think are discussed or or seen much within the GitOps space yet. So I expect uh, to hear a lot of those kind of things from that type of practitioner, those starting to adopt uh, some of the principles that, that were discussed. 
Yeah, I, well, I, I, I sort of think it like it almost forces your hand, right? I think if, I, if I'm looking at my crystal ball, I'm, I'm saying that there's going to be a reemergence of DevOps because things like Kubernetes and GitOps forces your hand into that. So Cornelia, real quick. So, you know, take a couple of minutes. What do, what do you think is next? Yeah, I'll make it even quicker than a couple of minutes. So mm -hmm. first of all, I want to clarify that I, I would call it the adoption cycle, not the hype cycle. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that we are in, still in the, the, the skinny part of the tail on, you know, the, 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 uh, crossing the chasm. Um, I don't think we've crossed the chasm yet. I think that we, because we spend so much time in this space, we we kind of delude ourselves into thinking that this is more widely adopted than it is. I think we haven't crossed the chasm yet. So that's that's the first point. And that's the part B of that point is what is our, I'm going to call it Kubernetes moment. Um, we had convergent systems, container-based convergent systems before Kubernetes. We had Cloud Foundry. We had um, oh, Mesos, um, right? Mesosphere. Mesosphere. We had uh -huh. uh, the other one that I'm thinking of that Red Hat bought. Um, Makara. You're talking about Makara? No, 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 no. That's the old. No, it. It, yeah. There was all kinds. Oh, there's all there's, there's all kinds of tools, by the way. Yeah. Everyone. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so we had those systems before, but like I said, I used to have to teach people about convergent systems and now I don't have to do that anymore. So that happened with Kubernetes. That was, you know, Kubernetes obviously is a hugely successful open source project and we could spend a lot of time thinking about what were the elements that made it successful. But the fact is that we had a Kubernetes moment where there was a tipping point and we have definitely not hit that tipping point yet. So the future of GitOps is still looking for that tipping point um, and then I think we'll see a whole lot more innovation in so many different ways. You know what? That 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 other name's gonna come to you in the middle of the night, and you're gonna be like, "That's what I meant." Oh. I'm gonna Google it right now. <laughs> yeah, it always happens later, right? <laughs> so, so, um, so next, uh, uh, Jamie, what do you what do you think? So, what what do you think is Core is, OS? Uh, Oh, Coro OS, there you go. There right. which, which I didn't even the... have to Google it. I finally remembered it. Right, oh, which okay, is the go. foundation <laughs> of Red Hat Core OS, which is yeah. underneath OpenShift, That's and right, yeah. Fedora Core OS, which is underneath OKD for the nodes. Right. Um, I think the intelligence part is going to come in. So right now we have people putting changes into Git, automated reconciliation between Git and the services, the intelligence their machine learning, artificial intelligence is going to fill that in. So it's not people, it's actually the machine intelligence making those changes to Git and then the reconciliation. So it, that's the next step. Yeah, pretty soon we'll all be out of a job. So like you really touched touched a uh, a nerve there with Cornelia because she's now on the Alexa team. So she's like, yes, exactly, right? Oh, ML. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'd be like, hey, Alexa, scale that cluster for me. It'll be like she does it on her own because, you know, she like, oh, notices a... a right, I, I and that's the I think thing. you're right. Yeah. yeah. You, you can start, because um, machine learning can like uh, predict when you'll have spikes in your cluster and it'll start preemptively scaling your cluster, let's say. So that that's really um, that's really interesting. Is there's that AI ML ops, um, you know that. So that that's that's really really cool. I also see see something like that um, coming up. So Pinky, I'll give you the floor at the end. Um, what 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 do you this now now it's yours. What do, what do you predict? It's actually funny. I just want to say my old teammate Russ. He actually no. texted me the other day, and he's like, "Oh, so okay, so is Flux now implemented with Alexa yet? Can I tell?" No, Alexa it's a, it's a <laughs> yeah, it's really funny. I'll be that Yeah, there you that's, go. that's the future. Is is what yeah. I see. Um, no, I just think it's for me. It's really hard to see like an end game, I guess, because there's just so many things that keep changing. When I when I first started, um, I don't know what just happened. Can y'all still hear me? Yep. Yes. We okay, cool. Um, so I, uh, when, when I first started with GitOps, um, like progressive delivery wasn't even a thing that was really implemented yet um, for the whole process. And then, you know, things like Flagger came along. And, and so there's, there's still things that are so cool and innovative that are still changing, like what's possible with GitOps. And so... Um, mm -hmm.